Welcome to the Clarinet Podcast, the show about all that's new and neat with clarinet, with the neatest people in the industry. You can support the ongoing production of this independently produced program by donating to our Patreon at clarinet.com support. Supporters get early access to extended ad-free podcasts and exclusive access to patron-only episodes and live events. And now for today's episode with Barry Green, author of The Inner Game of Music. Hi, I'm your host, Sean Perrin. Today is the first ever Clarinet Book Club episode, and I'm super excited to finally share it with you. I know it's been a long time coming, and I am sorry that it took so long, but uh, I won't get into it all again. But many of you who've been listening along know that I had a, my first kid in June, and having a monthly book club was just not something which uh, was a great idea at the time, to say the least. So anyways, I'm hoping to do this still once or twice a year. And the next book is Alex Ross, The Rest is Noise. So you can head to clarinet.com books to pick up a copy of that one. And if you missed today's book, The Inner Game of Music, by Barry Green, who I already said was coming on the podcast today. Um, you can check that out as well, clarinet.com slash books. If you'd like to have the chance to vote on which book should be selected next for the Clarinet Book Club, you can join our free Facebook group. Head to facebook.com slash clarinet. I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Barry Green. We dive into, of course, his book, The Inner Game of Music. He also tells me about a few of his other books and why it's so important to be mindful, not only while you're playing, but also just generally in your life as a musician. I hope you enjoyed this conversation, and thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the Clarinet Podcast. Today's episode of the show is brought to you in part by Diderio Woodwinds and their new weekly trivia show called Don't Blow It. You can check it out every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time on their Instagram channel. And if you know the right answers to the questions, you might even have the chance to win some amazing new gear. By the way, if you haven't checked out Diderio's new reserve clarinet reads, you're in for a real treat. They're using some amazing new technology and manufacturing techniques that are helping achieve super consistent results. These reeds are now available for E-flat, B-flat, and bass clarinet, and you can pick up a box at your local music store. Or, if you want to order online, you can head right now to clarinet.com slash reeds. So let's talk about a couple of the principles that are in there. And one of the ones I love the most was right in the opening when we, we go over sort of what the concepts are, um, is this equation of performance equals potential minus interference. Um, and there's a particular sentence that I want to just read here. It is helpful to notice your thoughts and how much they contribute to your activity and how much they interfere with it. And that seems like a totally revolutionary um, sentence to anyone who's not really familiar with mindfulness um, and awareness in the sense that you talk about in the book. So so in a nutshell, that equation, how can we really glean something from it and what does it mean to you? So we just want to be as good as we can be, period. And so we want our performance to be equal to our potential. And if there's no interference, we've accomplished that. So what we're doing with the inner game is working with the I. Get, your, get the I or the me out of the way. And everybody kind of agrees with that pretty unequivocally that, that we do get in our own way. And it's when you're upset with yourself, it wasn't somebody else that made the mistake. It's you're the one that kind of like screwed up a little bit. And so it's the I. So if we could remove the I or the interference in terms of the formula, then all that's left is you and your potential. So that's what we're after. It's nice to have a formula because when I do lectures and I talk to people or whatever, there's always mathematician and academic people that want to monitor and be able to write notes down and be very happy that they're they're doing something. But this is the total opposite from being academic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, of course, in the equation, we have to figure out, you know, what is the interference and what is the potential? And basically, you came or uh, the concept of the inner game is that there's this self one who is this sort of interference, this self-critical um, person who's getting in the way. And self two is sort of your your inner inner potential, and it seems to me that the assumption is usually or almost always that that self one is negative. And I I just was wondering, have you encountered instances where the self one is actually overly positive and thus interfering in sort of its own way? Self one is the one that has a voice and speaks in the native language of the performer, whether it's German or English or Italian or or whatever. Uh, so if you hear a voice. And if you're listening to it, it's taking away from your concentration. Um, and whether it's telling you the right things to do, which my tennis lesson, my steam lesson, and my bass lessons, they're all filled with internal instructions, whether they come from an expert teacher, whether they come from what you've been told, what you've learned, what you're trying to do, what you've been 
believe is the right thing to do. Um, if you're following an instruction, you're not doing one really critical thing, which is not so much stress in, in these books, but it's something that I've learned to live by and something that I believe in intently. And that is we play music by listening. We don't play music by texting and having a conversation while you're driving a car or while you're playing a Brahms Sonata. Uh, it's a oral internal experience that is a channeling of musical energy. And anything that stands in the way, like having a conversation with your mother or your teacher or your spirit or your, worship, your wishes um, is a form of interference good, bad, ugly, beautiful. <laughs> so, um, and self too doesn't have a voice. It's, there's, there's no language to self voice. There could be some guttural sounds like, uh, <laughs> <or laughs> breathing and whatever. But other than that, it's sound and music, uh, in our situation. Uh, so now here's the question. Um, what about good instructions? What's wrong with that? Well, if you're dialoguing with that and if you're paying attention to it, you're listening. You're not, you're listening to that and you're not listening to the music. If you agree with the assumption that we play music by listening, uh, by consuming and merging and uh, channeling sound and energy, then why the hell are you talking about something else? <laughs> you don't need it. Um, in the perfect world, you can't do that very long all the time. So there are times where you instantly have to remind yourself between phrases or come in and out. You're straddling. There's no question you're straddling a fence between the technical discipline and needs of rhythm and pitch and all the accurate things that we train ourselves to do and the inspirational side, which is just the pure channeling of the music. You got to have both of it, but you cannot be thinking and be cautious and taking steps to follow instructions at the same time that you're pouring your heart out. Our ultimate goal is that the training is such that it's automatic and it's physical. It's learned um, it's learned in the body, so you don't have to be controlling it. You could be aware of it, you can, but you want it to uh, happen uh, without thoughts and without control. Um, one of my, there is one thing that I do remember I wrote in the Inner Game a Music book, and it doesn't come from me. It comes from the famous violinist Yehudi Menuhin, and he said that we talked in person after a concert in Cincinnati and he, he said that um, when people are trying to stay in control or control something, they think that the goal is to make sure that everything is the way it was supposed to be. So they're trying to be in control and not let anything out of control. Well, Menuhin said our best control is when we're least aware of it. Okay. That's profound. I mean, that's really... That, that's really something else. I mean, um, we think of control as like an active process, but uh, in a sense, our best control is letting go of control uh, so that we don't even know it's happening, but it's just happening. So, so we think the self one control is important because of telling us the good things. I'm saying, um, no, if we're engaged in it, uh, it's taking some of your energy away so you'll be as effective as the remainder of your concentration that's not listening or dialoguing with, with that. Even though we're constantly aware and we're constantly um, straddling this line between our attention to detail and our pursuit of unconsciousness. I found it most distracting, actually, before I would engage in something. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, sort of this self-dialogue and criticism, and it can distract you off the point of ever actually starting something. But once I get started, I find it's not really there. Well, when you say once you've started it, hopefully that's playing. And then... Exactly, yeah. 
so you, if you want, you can have all the self one you like uh, while you're not playing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but frankly, uh, there's also such a thing as in sports and in music as your game phase or your music phase. There's a point in which you're waiting for a solo that begins with the solo clarinet at the beginning of a movement. And if you wait until the sound comes out for you to shut up your anxieties, uh, you're not going to really be in character. Would you kind of agree with that? I mean, you really have to, even if it's silence. I mean, it's wonderful when there's music that leads up to your solos or to your whatever it is that you're playing so that you could somewhat ride that chip. You can get into the rhythm and the sound and the energy. Um, Harvey Phillips, great tuba player, told me that... Um, that some he's got some symphonies or some operas where he plays two or three or four notes, um, period, for an hour or two. He has to sit and wait for one one hour or two hours. So, so what is he supposed to do? And he told me that um, every sound of every note comes from the notes that preceded. And if he's not listening to everything beforehand, he won't be able to play it in the same way as if he you know, checks out and then comes in right in time for his particular pitch. Uh, it's it's a part of that. So when there's sound that leads up to what you're doing, that's a wonderful focus for your attention to park your attention and to force your attention to connect with that because it's part of what you do. And the other part of, of what, what I mentioned we play by listening is that we're also – when we play, we're playing the whole score. We're not just playing our individual part, but we're playing all of the winds, all the rhythm, all the harmony, all the sounds is a part of you, just like a conductor. Uh, so that's, that's essential to be a part of your attention. So in a sense, you really don't have a lot of time to be dealing with your inner self one dialogue uh, when you're on stage. And even the process of getting to the stage, even take a big recital or a big concert or something like that. In some ways, some people put their game face on months and months before their performance. I mean, if you're going to a Super Bowl or a Carnegie Hall recital or something like that, you don't start thinking about that the week before the concert, even though you're practicing your solos. I mean, you're anticipating all of that. And the things that distract you from that don't really belong. Well, and that reminds me of another aspect of the book, which I loved was the, uh, the keeping of the journal to track your long-term goals and even your short-term goals, and then sort of checking in to make sure that those were working. And there was a little story in there about someone who kept a little silver star, I think, in the top right corner of their mirror um, or their bathroom or something. And they would look at it every day and they would go, okay, that's, that's reminding me that I want to play. I think it was with the Met Opera one day or something like that. Um, and so just being aware of kind of the fact that you can't do everything all at once and you've got all these little pieces to put together and, and, and work through your entire musical career, not just, you know, today to, to get that whole distance. That's so kind of profound. Um, and, and the other thing that was really interesting, and I'd want your, your thoughts on this kind of is um, as musicians, I feel like especially students focus so much on trying to perfect their performance. They practice it a hundred times so they can get it right that once for their concert or whatever. But there was a, a comment in the book, and I wish I wrote the exact quote down, but something like yesterday's uh, creative performance repeated today um, becomes kind of today's monotony or something like that. And the goal of music should really be to learn to recreate the piece fresh every single time. Um, yeah, that was such an amazing sort of sentence there. And it's something I really want to try and sort of instill more in my students. So how can we get out of this super repetitive mindset more and work towards that sort of getting inside the music as a fresh experience. I compare the musical journey to uh, taking a canoe or, or a trip down a river that you might want to go down, who knows, 50 times, 100 times. So you may have taken a trip 50 times down the same river, but why do you keep going? I mean, you have the same journey, you're going from point A to point B, you're using the same paddles and you're using the same boat. So that's like playing the same notes, the same instruments, the same piece, whatever. But one day the river is high, the next day the river is slow, the next day it's fall, then it's winter, then it's spring, then the sky is blue, then there's then there, it's changing. And the whole experience, sometimes you're with a partner who's faster or slower than you. 
And so every single thing that you do is a response to what is around you, your personal experience, whatever that may be. And the same goes for a very slow movement of a, of a Mozart sonata. I mean, one note follows the next. And if it says soft, okay, we know there's infinite uh, variations of soft. And then when it says um, it's growing or you have a crescendo, I mean, there's hundreds of ways of doing a crescendo and from what dynamic, the variations. Uh, just look at a music composition. We've got only 10 notes to play with on the piano or whatever it might be, but all of the rhythmic uh, and musical combinations that have been possible from those, those keys have been going on for hundreds of years and nobody, nobody has a problem writing a new song <laughs> or a new symphony. So the, variety, the potential for creating music in the moment and the specific of one thing follows the next. So your breath, when you take a breath, every single time you take a breath, it's a different quantity of air uh, in a sense. And your strength from one day, I'm sure you know uh, from playing a wind instrument, your physical condition is, is important to you. So some days you wake up and you're really strong. Other days you wake up and you're not so strong or you're not feeling the same thing or you feel your breath is coming from a different place. Each one can produce a different nuance of sound it can affect a different tempo and energy for a Schumann piece versus a Brahms piece uh, or the same piece over and over. So, you know, absolutely. Um, uh, I've played certain pieces a lot of times in concerts because I do a lot of concert solo work. And honestly, I feel it. Well, I'd say the same thing about my inner game <laughs> um, interest and workshops and working with people. We've been doing it for 34, 35 years, and um, it never gets old to me. And I'm talking about the same things, but when I deal with solo uh, coaching demonstrations, no two are alike. It's always different. Um, and if it's a breathing exercise, it's always a little bit different, no matter what it may be. It's just being alive. Yeah, I think things may seem the same, but they're more different than we realize. And And that's one of the things you say in the book, too, is that if you're ever bored performing or practicing or any of these things, you're really probably just not aware or interested in a way that's that's meaningful because you can always find a way to engage yourself better. And I remember talking to some Broadway musicians on the podcast here, and one of my questions for them always is, how do you not become bored playing the same music for, let's say, 15 years? And um, they've come to sort of similar conclusions as far as like recreating the experience, trying to follow along with the other parts are doing and just being fully engaged, how can you be bored? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I agree with it. It is a discipline and it is a challenge. There's no question about that. But it's the commitment to that uh, the, while you're doing it. And that's why you say with practicing. Practicing is not, I don't know, it's got a negative connotation for some people. But mindless practicing, I don't, I don't believe in that. I honestly know when I sit down to practice, um, why am I doing this? What am I going over? What is it that I intend to have accomplished in this particular session? It could be a physical thing is that I'm not as strong and I'm not as quick and I'm not as alert. So I want to speed up my eye hand coordination, my consciousness coordination. It could be that I have work that needs to be done on some music that I'm learning that it's not consistent throughout the whole thing. So I'm working on specific spots that I want to bring to a, uh, a level so that I could feel comfortable with, with it and I don't have to think about it when I play. But I don't waste time. I don't even really have that much time when I'm practicing. So I, I have to practice um, efficiently and I have to practice with a reason. And so if I'm bored practicing, I wouldn't I, I don't have time to get bored. I just wouldn't do it. Uh, and I don't see why that should change. Otherwise, people that go through um, uh, mundane practicing, if it's for the purpose of developing muscles or speed or coordination, I could understand that. That's like going to a gym and you're building up muscles. You want to get stronger and faster. OK, there's reason. If it's to master the instrument, there's a time 
uh, where we need to devote years and hours and hours of practice to what is it? The ten thousand hours of practice is necessary to become a you know a master of your instrument, whatever it is. There pe- people have different ideas about that. Well, that's meaningful too. You're, if you're trying to achieve a consistent sound and a consistent um, speed and a consistent dynamic, that takes practice. But if you don't want that, then why are you doing it? And if you do want it, then you're not wasting your time. And how can you get bored with it when you see there's progress? Perhaps it's incremental progress. Um, Perhaps we need to fight boredom with more awareness of the incremental progress we are making. That could be a, a real important value for the teacher to reflect that to the students so that they they stay motivated or to the professional or to anybody at any level. That's something they may have to remind themselves that why you may have spent this time doing something uh, so it's not three times correct, but five, 10 or 20 times correct. Well, that was an accomplishment and it, it's engaging. Yeah, absolutely. And so I guess what you're kind of saying is the, the, the technical facility, that's kind of like going to the gym, but the performance of the music, that's more like, let's say a sport. Like if you go, if I go to the gym every day for 10 years, I'm not just going to wake up one day and be a, a master, um, you know, tennis player or something. I actually, actually have to play the sport as well as the technique and and the physical strength. I I totally agree with that. Totally agree with that. But that's a different kind for, for answering the question of being bored with practice. Um, you shouldn't be bored with practice but there's different kinds of practice. There's musical practice, which is learning the music and, and formulating and shaping and, do, and playing with the music, um, playing with your own spontaneity, your own feelings. But there's the other side of yourself. The person that's playing it has to be a clean artist that has their uh, alertness and their technique at their disposal so that everything that goes into their mind comes out through their hands and through their instruments. And that that means that we are small muscle athletes, as we know, and we have to stay in good shape. Yeah, I think you're so right in the sense that you have to have different types of sort of practice session. I mean, um, and one of the ones I love from the book is the whole uh, bit about inviting distractions in and, and allowing yourself to experience things that in a performance situation might sort of catch you off guard, you know, uh, whether it be someone talking or a radio coming on or off or a phone ringing in this day and age, you know? And um, I think that's a really brilliant way of getting practical real world experience because I, I sometimes wonder if the reason people are so nervous is because they're, they're practicing and preparing to play in a world that doesn't really exist. I mean, we live in a world where a cell phone could go off, the fire alarm could start, uh, it could start raining on you, your string could break, your reed could snap, you know, anything could go wrong. And if you, if you have never ever encountered any of that, in your practice and it happens in your performance, you're done. Well, there's truth to that. Um, There's also truth to the fact that over the course of someone's young career, most things that can go wrong will eventually go wrong. And once you've had your hand burnt by the stove, you don't generally go back to the same thing and uh, with the same carelessness. And so um, there's a time in our younger, the younger part of developing our career uh, where you talk about creating distractions, where you need to be prepared for as many things as possible so that it's not the first time that it happens. And then when you are presented with that, you're comfortable in your commitment to changing your direction into the music and staying on track, okay? If you've never had that experience, then it's a good way to do that. That's why the football players put on the um, put the speakers out for to simulate loud noise and practice in the rain and do all of those other things. They try to simulate practice conditions or every kind of a football, every kind of a sport condition that we would have to deal with. Um, so this is um, that's a part of the process over a period of time. You become much more experienced. That's why somebody in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s is much more of a cool dude because they've had more life experiences and everything that could have happened on stage at one point or another has probably happened 
And on a subconscious or a physical or a conscious level, they have some experience and willingness to deal with this. Uh, our health in, the, in a given moment at any time is, is always subject to change, but our ability to, to work within hazards, within conditions, is, um, is something that we need to prepare for. A teacher can tell you about those things. Uh, you can read them about it in a book, but when you've experienced yourself in a concert, it's a whole different thing. Um, and uh, when you don't have the opportunity to experience those, then we have to do as much as we can in preparation um, in advance to do that. And that's where I suggested, you know, adding those kinds of distractions. There's another side of it, too, though, is that um, we are practicing a discipline of mind control, paying attention to something that's going to help us refocus on music when our mind is in a bad state because it's been distracted. That's, that's what inner game does. The inner game saves you time and allows you to make a quicker recovery because human nature is going to get you no matter what. You're going to have good days, bad days, but you need to have a toolbox filled with things that are all setting you in a proper course correction that's about music that will get you so you can return to this wonderful state of uh, relaxed concentration. That's our goal where you're both calm and you're alert at the same time and everything's flowing and you're you don't need to be telling yourself what to do. So the process of noticing something's wrong and has to be fixed and then course correcting back onto the straight and narrow so you can be unconscious and relax and play, that is a discipline. And so that's something that often hasn't been taught that much. The men, you know, we're told what to do and how to do it, but we're not told how quickly we could change our attention from one thing to another, or we haven't been given necessarily um, the tools of a technique of attention as much as the technique of a sound production, you know? And so that needs to be practiced. That needs to be, you know, they say you, you can't practice, you can practice practicing, but you can't practice performance without ever performing. So you have to practice performing by performing. And that's one of our best teachers. And so the same thing goes for learning how to operate under pressure. You need, that's a different skill. It has nothing to do with the technique of being a great musician or clarinet player. It's your attention, your ability to focus under pressure and have your mind in the right place. And when it's not in the right place, recognize where, where it is and having a strategy and a course that will direct you back onto the safe road where you could hopefully relax and not think of anything and then forget about it. So inner game, never want, you never want it to be a way of playing music because that's terrible, it doesn't work. It's just a temporary way to put your attention on the music and relax and hope that you can now forget about everything and not listen to that self one, whether it's good instructions or bad instructions. See, it, that reminds me that you talk a lot about um, the educational perspective of the inner game in the book. And what do you feel is the legacy of this? And do you feel that these, these attitudes uh, towards music are, are changing in a positive way because of your, your teachings and direct involvement? Inner game is nothing new. Uh, inner, inner game has been around for thousands of years. Um, it's only a reflection of what goes on in the state of a human being when things really go well. Okay. Uh, we spend too much time talking about the things that don't go well and fighting what that is, but how much time do we talk about what works and what is there? How can we strive towards an unconscious state when we're unconscious? I mean, uh, it's, it's like, have you ever known when you fall asleep at night? Uh, I've been trying to figure that out. Uh, I'm in my 70s, and I, I still can't know that exact moment when I was conscious and I became unconscious. 
it slips in so carelessly. And so to try to formulate what goes on in an unconscious state and to strive for that is really an upside down experience. It's, it's quite a challenge. Uh, so keeping that in mind that the inner game has always been around, um, people call it by different names, um, but, but being at your best and being in the zone and, and connecting with what you do and with your breath, the principles of attention, which as I mentioned is the discipline, is based on Zen. Uh, it's based on consciousness and technically meditative uh, techniques and meditation, some people don't like or are, are, are put off by that word, but all it means is paying attention to one thing, okay? So the purest form of meditation is just listen to your breathing and just anything, any thoughts that go into your mind, you tune them out, you go back to your breathing. That's exactly what we're doing with music. The only difference is that music is changing moment by moment and your breath stays quite same. But the discipline of being able to keep your attention on one thing is something that we've been doing forever. And Tim Galway was just very clever at taking these principles and applying them to sports. And in sports or tennis, that was a metaphor. Uh, so people can, most people have been out on a tennis court so that they can apply those things to music or business or any other any other physical activity where you're invested in a skill and you're attempting to express that under pressure when people are keeping score. So you have the problem of silencing that inner distraction. That's human nature. It's been going on forever. So I expect this to go on forever. What name people use to call it, that's going to change. Um, the discipline has not changed at all since I've been involved. I get a little better at describing it and using some words, finding some new words uh, that better represent a, an experience of sound. Uh, when I go to Germany or to France or to Spain and we have different words, everybody's got different words for awareness, commitment, and trust. Um, and um, sometimes there's one word that goes in between some of these other two words. Uh, and um, or there's two words that go for our one word. They're just words. Um, and so that can be refined over the periods of time. Uh, and our use of these words change uh, as well over decades. But but what we're after has been going on since we're since we've been human beings on the planet and human nature has been human nature um for a long long time so we're just trying to just trying to get along and just do our thing and have a good time so maybe a better question is then why do you think it's not obvious for the average person to reach these conclusions because you mentioned that a lot of the best artists and the best um of anything really they find this focus in this sort of self um discipline almost the, this mindfulness mind state but the average person seems to really benefit from reading a book like this or learning about meditation or something that teaches them how to do this. So, well, um, the, the best compliment I've always got, which I hear over and over again, is that the inner game for them represents their own personal experience. It's not my book. It's not something I've given them. I've, I'm the recipient of some gratitude from people, but I was never there for somebody who helped themselves uh, by reading the book. I had nothing to do with it. Uh, so, you know, it's just um, people, I, I formulated what I expressed in the book by watching conductors um, sitting in my chair as principal bass of the Cincinnati Symphony. And I paid attention to what they were saying when I was watching the clock as far as when rehearsal would get out. And I paid attention afterwards to that elusive time when I was not watching the clock. I was so engaged in what I was doing that I was unaware of time. And so between those two things, I came up with some observations that some conductors were what I called classic inner game 
conductors because I, I, I made lists of what was good instructions and how these things really were effective uh, in rehearsals so that I was totally absorbed in what I did. And when I watched the clock, it meant I was bored or I was upset or I had something else to do. And so, and these conductors never heard of the inner game, but I wrote the inner game book based on what the conductors said and what I observed in lessons and teaching and all the other things saying this worked, that didn't work. So in a sense, it's been around all along. Um, Timothy Galway was very clever to, to give us self one and self two and get us a better understanding so that we can recognize ourselves in this drama when we get caught up in our own stuff and find other ways to get around it. And um, so it becomes non-controversial. It doesn't change, uh, but it's nothing really new. Now, the problem is that a lot of people don't pay attention to this stuff. You know, they're so concerned with outer games, being successful, making money, uh, not making mistakes, uh, pleasing their parents and their teachers and their juries and, and, and all of these things. These are outer games. These have nothing to do with, with music. When you're on that path or you're doing something just because you're told that's the way it's supposed to be, even though it doesn't work, um, it doesn't work. Um, and so there aren't as many people telling them what does work is there are people what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing. And so that's part of growing up. It's part of maturing. Absolutely. So do you yourself practice a form of mindfulness, like a, something that you do or like a meditation, I mean, a meditation practice? Well, um, when it comes to music, well, yeah, there are things that I do all the time for my own mind. Uh, we just bought a home on the Ohio River, and I just can't stop looking at that river. Uh, and once again, like like the canoe trip, every time I look at it, the sky is different, the current's different, the traffic is different, the view is different, the wind, the air, the humidity. Uh, and I spend, I've never done this that much since we moved here, but I can spend an hour on the patio and now we're in the living room. I can go upstairs the bedroom. We have a view over there. And, but being in nature is, is one of the most important things I think for any human being. Um, um, I walk, I hike, I bike, all those things, they're re repetitive motions that put your mind in one place. So that's a meditation on the river. It's a meditation of, uh, the physical meditation on a bike beyond a certain amount of time, just like walking or running or being any place where it's you're not being bombarded by video games or cell phones. It's like food. It keeps you balanced. And then when I've been away from nature or I've been so consumed with work or bills or income tax or wh whatever else it might be or politics, uh, I forget what it's like to be a human being. And, um, and you, you have to remind yourself or have a discipline in which you can go back to say so that you're, you know, you get your, in some ways, we don't, you don't want to get too obsessed with yourself. You want to get out of, away from yourself. Why do people go to concerts? Why do they go to movies? Why do they read books? In all these cases, it's an escape of getting out of your mind and getting into on a, another level, something that feeds your soul or something that's um, makes you feel more like a human being, like you're alive and like you're well. Um, that's why I don't understand when and why people retire uh, at the end of their life. Uh, but the fact is, I, I feel I never worked a day of my life. Uh, uh, so I retired when I was 21 and I got my first job with the symphony. But still, I mean, um, it's it's living. And when I say when you when I say that about retiring, I mean, why stop if you're fortunate enough, like so many of us artists in the arts to use the arts to go through your life, you know, as a pathway of learning, pathway of living. Um, why you would want to stop doing something that feeds your soul, put it that way. And um, uh, and then do something uh, just 
over and over. Now, if you decide you want to take up music or you taking up sailing or something like that, I, I understand that or travel. That's stimulation. That's that's a whole different thing. But uh, but but to be active and alive and and doing music as so many of us do. And then to say, OK, I'm done with that. I'm retiring now. I'm going to just play golf every day. Uh, well, if you're really into golf, that is a good idea. But <laughs> it depends on how you how you approach that. Do you think that students and people in general in today's day and age are facing a different level of challenge to achieve inner game ideals than when you first wrote the book because of technology? Well, I haven't. I've never thought of that, but in in the positive side, the technology, the obsession to gaming, um, if you want to talk about games, I don't do that. I have a grandson who can't get off that and listens to music all day long and is on the video games. Well, there's something about us. Well, there's other things in life, first of all, but there's another side of it that he's learned a level of concentration <laughs> that... Uh, that is nothing we never did. We never worked at something for five or six or seven hours uh, when we were growing up, at least when I was growing up, you know. So there, the inner game is about developing that sense of concentration, being able to pay attention to one thing at a time. And that skill is helpful. So to say that the people of our younger generations don't have those skills or need those to be taught those skills I would, I would question, uh, they probably have a lot of those skills. It's just how they're using it and what they're using it for. Hmm. I love how you put a positive spin on that. That's so interesting because I actually agree and I haven't been able to put my finger on what I was thinking, but recently I thought to myself, well, how come it is that I can sit and be on my computer and time can just evaporate for 30 minutes. But when I sit down and try to read myself, one is there talking to me constantly. You know, so and I was critical of myself thinking like, well, I obviously I lack concentration, but no, you're right. I'm just differently using my concentration. So what is it about staring at my computer, reading blog posts that keeps me more, more, more engaged than a piece of paper? You know, maybe it's just a different way that I've used my brain. Commitment is one third of the inner game <clears throat> is how, much, how bad do you want it and what your what is your goal? And uh, sometimes you might be more interested in what's available in the blog than what it is, the topic that you're reading on the book um, in a different way. And so that's a, a big part of it. It's so much a part of it. In fact, I think that is the driving force for everything that we do. Some in music, when I find people that are questioning you know, game techniques or not sure that this is going to work there they have a different motivation they they want it to be a technique to work for them so that they could be successful uh and win a job or win an audition or not be nervous well that's not what the inner game is about the inner game is about reaching your potential within yourself when you're using it as a technique it's not designed for that it's t technically a that, that's literally a distraction and so um the Commitment, the problem that I get with so many people is that they want to have it both ways. They want to use the inner game, but they still want to use it so they can be successful. And they don't want to let go of not knowing what the what's going to happen. You know, remember Yehudi Menuhin saying your best control is when you're least aware of it. Well, their, their idea of control is they want to know everything's going to come out exactly the way they practiced it. And they're not interested in anything else as long as they don't make any mistakes and they play perfect. That's a different agenda. In a way, what you're saying is if you're using the inner game completely properly as a technique, in the moment, you won't know that you're using it. Well, you're, no, I, I want you to know that you're, you're using the, the technique, but then use it uh, to get out of trouble as quickly as possible and then get back into not using it. But can, well, I guess what I'm asking is, can the inner game techniques become a different form of self one? They are self one while you're doing it. While you're playing that game, you are no longer you're working at, at you're working at something that is seventy percent bad and thirty percent good and trying to change those numbers to make it ninety percent good. Okay. So definitely you're detracting, you're you're playing your technique, but you're trying to make your numbers go down so that you're back in the fold and then you can forget about the whole thing. 
It's a temporary toolkit vehicle to get back on track uh, to a state of not mindfulness, but mindlessness. I like that. There we go. (laughs) You know, you remind me, there's another podcast I listen to, and he sometimes talks about meditation. And uh, one of the things he said was, you know, the reason that I enjoy, not I'm speaking as him, but he says the reason that I enjoy meditation and, and being mindful is is because let's say I have a fight with my wife or, you know, something doesn't go well at the grocery store. There's such a huge difference between being upset and angry for maybe five minutes or one minute than two weeks or five years. And the destruction that that causes in one's life is, com- and, and the way that you can deal with situations becomes totally revolutionized. So in a way, I feel like that's almost what the inner game has kind of led me towards anyways, is the idea that you can notice these sort of criticisms and distractions and, and deal with them in a fraction of the time it would normally take. That's 100% the goal. You, you nailed it. So uh, replay that uh, or put that as your opening sentence as a, as a byline or whatever it is. It's your own <laughs> words. You said it. I didn't say it. But you're absolutely right. It's it's. It's having that tool. Now, here's the other good news is they say your best offense is a good defense. You've ever heard that expression? Uh, And so that when you're equipped with all of these pathways to recovery from a less positive state to a more positive state, you're going to be bothered a lot less. And then your ability to function under pressure is you're going to have more experience knowing a pathway and a direction that you're going. So your techniques are going to work quicker. You're more prepared with them and you'll need to use them a lot less often. But let's not forget human nature. It's always going to be that way. I get, I get nervous all the time uh, and I work at it, but I know the rules of the game. (coughs) Um, And my hope, my challenge is just to be uh, as ready as possible and work at it. And in the end, the word game is important because it is a game. You don't always win. You know, you may be working to try to listen to the sound or to feel per- energy or to remember a particular movement. But it, just because you're striving for that doesn't mean it's going to happen. <laughs> you'll, you'll be better off playing that game than barking up a tree where it, it's a trap and it's never going to work for you. Well, I love your whole thing about self-discovery, too. And it, I was watching a YouTube video one time, and there was this guy who would invented a new bassoon-looking instrument. Someone in the interview asked him, well, what's the highest note? And he said, I don't know. I haven't discovered it yet. And it made me realize suddenly, like, wait a second, all of our instruments are, are kind of like that, you know? And um, there was a, a guy who came on the podcast named Francois Ull who mentioned, uh, I think it was Francois, who said uh, he loves extended techniques because there was a point where everything was an extended technique at the beginning of, you know, the instrument's history, you had to learn how to do literally everything on it. So um, we focused on the inner game of music today, but of course you've written other books. In a nutshell, for listeners who want to expand kind of their reading of your writing, uh, would you just sort of go into what your other books are about and where they can be found? Sure. Well, the second book that I, or the first book that I did all on my own was The Mastery of Music. It's published by Broadway Books. It's in both paperback and hardback. Um, and it's also international, and at least in the UK, it's Macmillan Books and Pan Books. Um, and it was based on 120 interviews with world famous musicians, mostly in the US and the UK. Uh, but they were in cat, they were on 10 topics of the human spirit. Um, and such topics as courage, confidence, passion, discipline, creativity, tolerance, discipline. Uh, the clarinet players were in the discipline chapter, actually. Were. And in <laughs> each, each of these topics, I went to a group of instrumentalists who, or musicians that lived in that world so that we could have a town hall discussion in print over a period of months and months of interviews. And so it was a very exciting six year period of my life that was inspired essentially by a failed inner game demonstration. The point was that you may have all of the mental techniques memorized with the inner game and be a master of that, 
but it doesn't mean that you could communicate. It doesn't mean that you, the music that you're playing that that is passionate or is expressive or uh, is humorous or whatever it might be, creative, that that's going to come out and bring it alive. Uh, it just means that you're not going to be nervous and it means that that you're focusing on your concentration. And so the second area that I got into was this journey into the uh, to what makes you unique and what makes you special uh, as a human being. And that's the voice that you carry to the stage. This is why you'll be hired as one out of 100 clarinet players who's going to be in the audition or who's going to get on gigs or who will be honored at your funeral, not for the notes you played or your technique, but what it was that you brought to the world and to the people around you. And that's that's what the uh, Mastery of Music is all about. Um, I interviewed people like Bobby McFerrin, Frederica von Stad, David Brubeck, Joshua Bell, Eddie Daniels, uh, um, and uh, all in these different areas, um, Christopher Parkening. It was just quite an amazing opportunity to explore what we think goes on and realize that it is quite different than what we think. Um, that was the mastery of music. And then the last 10 or 12 years, I wrote Bringing Music to Life, which is essentially the same as the inner game, three skills um, that are physical skills, which have to do with us communicating through our bodies, whether we're actors, dancers, singers, or musicians, is the physical skills of breath, uh, rhythm, or pulse, and movement. This was quite an intensive project that resulted in a DVD as well as a book that's published by GIA Music. It is similar to the inner game in that it's a process of playing. The inner game is a way of playing music of, for your concentration, and then the bringing music to life is the inner game for the body, okay? It deals with the physical skills which have to be emphasized uh, and mastered. Um, unlike inner game skills, um, you need to master the ability to concentrate, but the skills are mental skills that are have an instant impact. You know, they're attention skills. If you're looking at something, you see something. You don't need to put on glasses. <laughs> Bringing music to life skills, our voice, rhythm, and movement skills need to be learned and embraced into our pedagogy in such a way that it isn't given to us at this time. Um, so that, that was the third book. As I also mentioned, past that third book, um, my, I don't know that it's gonna take the form of a fourth book or not. It may and it may not, but I've been doing a lot of writing um, like Victor Wooten's, uh, he scooped me. He wrote the book that I wanted to write, but he wrote it in his own word, which is the music lesson. But this is on the topic of the how and the why. And when I'm doing lectures and, and visits to, to conferences and stuff like that, I will invite myself to do my how and why lecture. And I'll have to maybe do an inner game lecture because that's what they, why they engage me. But if they want to know what I'm what I'm really doing now, it's the high how and why. And I believe me, I still love doing inner game, and I don't disregard that. It's just that it's only a portion of my passion. Um, but it's like children. I mean, how can you love your daughter more than your son or your three? <laughs> you know, they're they're your babies. <clears throat> yeah. Totally. Well, thank you so much. I really hope to check out some of those other books and uh, maybe if they make their way onto the book club reading list, we'll have you back. Oh, that'd be lovely. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and uh, I hope this is of interest to your readers. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Clarinet Podcast. Show notes for this and all other episodes can be found at clarinet.com. While you're there, don't forget to join our email newsletter for free updates, exclusive offers, and a chance to win giveaways. Guests, requests, listener feedback, and comments can be sent to feedback at clarinet.com. Special thank you to our season sponsor, Dario Woodwinds. Don't forget to check out their new show, Don't Blow It, on Instagram, and also try a box of their new reserve clarinet reads next time you're at the music store. 
Claire Neat is made possible by listeners just like you. You can support the ongoing production of this independently produced program by donating to our Patreon at clairneat.com support. Supporters get early access to extended ad-free regular podcasts and exclusive access to patron-only episodes and live events. This program was produced and hosted by me, Sean Perrin, in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Music performed by Michael Lowenstern. Debate episodes co-hosted by Andrew Morrow. Audio editing by Brian Chappelles. And copy editing by Megan Taylor. That's all for now. Be sure to tune in next time for more of what's new and neat with clarinet with the neatest people in the industry on the Clarinet Podcast.